Beloved, the uh, study of Matthew is, is the study of a king. You remember Nathaniel's, or technically Nathanael's, momentous statement in the Gospel of John. You remember that? We've mentioned this before. John chapter 1 and verse 49, he says, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. That is a momentous statement. Now, you know, we have been in a study through the Old Testament answering the question, what did Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms speak about a coming Messiah? That was Jesus' statement on the Emmaus Road. Have you not read Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, what they say about me? So we got curious and we said, what do Moses and the prophets and the Psalms say about a coming Messiah? So we began in Genesis 3.15 and we looked at a lot of passages throughout the Old Testament. Last week we looked at Jeremiah 33 verses 14 through 26. We saw the covenant with David and the covenant with the Levites that God will keep his word. And when you come into the New Testament, Jesus comes on the scene And he begins to gather his disciples around him. When you have Nathanael saying, you are the son of God, you are the king of Israel, it is a statement that embraces all that the Old Testament says in a nutshell. It's like the whole law is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul and love your neighbor as yourself. That being encapsulated in the law, that short statement. When When Nathanael said what he said, He grasped the Old Testament statements, the prophecy about a coming king, and he also grasped the truth that this coming king, this greater David, would be deity as well. Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord, it's a conversation within the deity. He embraced all of these things, and that's why it's such a momentous statement. How can you encapsulate so much truth in such a short statement? phenomenal statement that he says that embraced everything in 2 Samuel 7 the Davidic covenant David I will raise up a house for you and the nature of the king his deity the pure essence of the Messiah you are the son of God the pure essence of rulership you are the king of Israel now Matthew once a slimy opportunist he collected taxes from his own people to give a Gentile, to give to a Gentile overlord, the Romans, he takes a sharpened reed in hand, moved by the Holy Spirit, about 25 years, 25, 27 years after Jesus ascended to the Father, and he writes a well laid out presentation of the ministry of Jesus Christ. This is a natural transition from looking at statements about his kingship, all of these, and there's a number of them that we could have looked at that we did not. Coming to the Gospel of Matthew, the theme of the Gospel of Matthew is this one statement, behold your king, that's it. You see it in Matthew 21 at the triumphal entry, he quotes Zechariah chapter 9 and verses 9 and 10. That's the theme of Matthew, behold Behold, you're king. And to the Jews who heard that, they should have immediately reflected back on all of those things that they should have known. And they are the ones, instead of the palm branches, they are the ones that should have fallen on their face and welcomed their king. But they did not. God's establishment of his covenant with David represents one of the theological high points of Old Testament scripture, 2 Samuel 7, called the Davidic covenant. That is the, now that Davidic covenant is the theological underpinning of Matthew. This is like the Davidic covenant worked out. The one who was promised to David, the greater David, gonna build him a greater house. This is him, behold your king. So to make that connection, hopefully the goal is to, for us to be strengthened in our understanding of how the Old Testament s- clues in and continues to speak about what the Gospels speak about. And you'll see in the Gospels an explanation of many of the statements in the Old Testament. And you're going to see a great deal of continuity here. This is not jagged, 
going back and forth. There's a great deal of continuity in this. And hopefully in the, long, in the short run and the long run, we will be strengthened to understand these scriptures this way. Perhaps the Lord would allow us to share the gospel and talk with a Jewish person who still is looking for or waiting for Messiah. And we can go to scripture, we can go to Genesis, and we can go to Psalm 110, Psalm 2, Psalm 16, 2 Samuel 7, Deuteronomy 18, Zechariah 12, Jeremiah. You can go a number of places and then you can bring it right into Matthew and say, here it is, look. Here is a fellow Jew making this argument step by step, very methodical, this is the Messiah. This is him, he's here. And that's what he does for the first 11 and a half chapters. Then what he's going to do is record the rejection. Second part of chapter 11 and chapter 12. And then anticipating the questions. Okay, let's say I believe you and he is the Messiah. What about the kingdom? The kingdom was promised. I know enough about the Old Testament to know that the kingdom was promised. And where is the kingdom if he was the Messiah? Ah, here's where the kingdom is. Here is Matthew 13, the parables of the kingdom. Because you rejected your king. It's all there. Is he coming back? Oh, absolutely. Matthew 24 and 25. Yes, he's coming back. I'll tell you about that as well. Very methodical as he walks through here. But that establishment, that, that covenant establishment with David in 2 Samuel 7 is the theological underpinning of the Gospel of Matthew. That event builds, that event continues to build uh, on the preceding covenants in other words, there was the Abrahamic covenant and there's an expansion of the Abrahamic covenant in the Davidic covenant and there's an expansion and indeed more detail of the Davidic covenant in the new covenant in Jeremiah 31. So this, that covenant builds on the preceding covenants and it looks forward to the ultimate establishment of God's reign on earth. That's what we read in Jeremiah 33 and Zechariah 9. Remember, when the Lord comes back again, Israel will say, will weep as a son who has lost a son, remember, they will look on me whom they have pierced. They didn't look on him whom they have pierced the first time he came. The first time he came, all they did was make fun of him and say, if you are who you say you are, call on your father and let him save you. That was not looking on him whom they have pierced. It doesn't even come close. The psalmist and the prophets provide additional details concerning the ideal David who will lead God's chosen nation in righteousness, no doubt. In the book of Revelation, John addresses him, the same one, as King of kings and Lord of lords in Revelation 19. So coming into the book of Matthew, we need to do a little bit of background, and I mean a little bit of background. We need to know that Matthew wrote for this, for his fellow Jews, it is a very Jewish gospel, the most Jewish of all the gospels. There are 129 references to the Old Testament. You really need to know the Old Testament fairly well in order to grasp uh, a depth of what Matthew is saying. He's writing to his people. He does not give an explanation because he's writing to people who already know the law and already know the prophecies. In the Gospel of Luke, for example, every once in a while, he'll give a little bit of an explanation because he's writing to Gentiles, but not in Matthew. Very Jewish. And the chronology for Matthew is not a concern. The chapters 1 through 4 and chapters 26 and 20, most of 27 are chronological. Other than that, it is a planned, methodical laying out of arguments for the, for the Messiahship of this man, Jesus, called the Anointed One, Jesus Christ. So Matthew, why is he writ, writing all these things? We've said that a couple of times already. He, is, he has written this to prove or to show the readers that Jesus is the promised Messiah. That's why he's writing. That's his goal. If, if his fellow Jews or even Gentiles read this and they come to an awareness that that Jesus is Messiah, then Matthew would say, I have accomplished my purpose in writing this gospel. Matthew is the systematic argument that Jesus is the Messiah, not the chronological one, the systematic argument 
that Jesus is Messiah. The theme, as we noted, is all is behold your king. It's methodical, it's deliberate. The facts are presented with evidence from Scripture, from the Old Testament. Then there's another category presented. For today we're going to look at the genealogy. And then after the genealogy, there's going to be another category of information, and then another category of information, and then another one. And he just continues to build on these things, build on one another. So the first block of that foundation that Isaiah, or excuse me, Matthew is giving here is the legal authority to be king. He needs to have the legal authority if we're ever going to give you a second look. That's a big deal in Jewish eyes. Not so much perhaps in our eyes, but it's a big deal in theirs. So this first block on that foundation is the legal authority to be king. We know it as a genealogy. One of those joyous things that you enjoy reading, a genealogy. So, we need to ask and answer what is the purpose of genealogy? Why is it so important? You see the genealogy in Genesis 10. First Chronicles has another one. There's one in, a huge one in Nehemiah. There's another one in, in Luke chapter 3 and there are others. Why genealogies? What's their purpose? Well, genealogies are oral, passed along, or written list of kinship. Kinship relationships between people or groups. They were or they were or they are a means of social identification. There are a couple of different kinds. There are linear genealogies. Linear gene genealogies list names that connect an individual to one specific member, or kin in that family. There's, in other words, it's one person per generation. There's my dad, there's me, then my son. But in reality, I have brothers and sisters and my son has brothers and sisters, but you only list one per generation. That's a linear genealogy. Segmented genealogies, they have a little bit of breadth. There's more than one person per generation that is mentioned. There's a brother, there are sisters, even cousins sometimes that are mentioned. And they also have depth, depth, one generation to the next generation. Mother to daughter, for example. And this is what we think of, this kind of genealogy is what we think of as the family tree. Segmented kind of genealogy. That's the family tree where you have everybody listed. And the first five books of the Old Testament called the books of Moses or the law or the Pentateuch, they have both kinds of genealogies in them. Genesis 10 and Genesis 5 are two different kinds of genealogy. So with that, why, Matthew, do you write these things to us? It means that we have to read them. Why do you do this to us? Well, the Jewish mind of the day, first and foremost, demanded an answer to, is this Jesus a descendant of the house of David? That's the question. Matthew knew, he knows his own people, he knows that if I don't establish this found from the very get-go this foundational element here they will not even give me a second hearing it was that big of a deal that big of an issue in their life so Matthew begins boldly in chapter 1 in verse 1 he says the record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah or the anointed one the son of David the son of Abraham very boldly doesn't tell us why he's writing now, if you were to look at the Gospel of Luke, you would say, I'm writing this to you, O Theophilus, in order that you might be, and he lists a reason why he's writing Luke. Matthew doesn't tell us why he's writing. We can look at all this information, and we know why he's writing. The argument is very clear, very concise as well. So the purpose of this genealogy, of course, is to prove that Jesus is in the line of David. He has the right pedigree. So Matthew gives the legal lineage of Jesus. His ancestry is what he's giving. Establishing his right to the throne of David is what he's doing here. Jesus was not the physical son of Joseph. He was not the physical son of Joseph. I think I need to put some of those up there. Because he was not the son of Joseph... He needed to have a connection. And he got that connection there. As you see that. 
So Jesus was not the physical son of Joseph, but when Joseph married Mary, Jesus became the legal son of Joseph and thus a possessor of all that belonged to Joseph's offspring. You follow, there are many sons that David had. One of his sons was named Nathan. If you follow Nathan's line all the way down, you find Mary. If you follow Solomon's line, another son of David, all the way down, you find Joseph. The problem is, is that in between Solomon and Joseph, there's this real winner called Jehoiakim. Remember, we read about him last week. Remember, you will be childless. This guy. He's cursed. He's he's not, no longer will the king come through him. Uh Uh-oh. But God promised he would come through David. So what do we do now? Okay, then we go through another one of David's sons. And both of these end up Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the Christ. It's extremely important to the Jew that this be established. And that's why Matthew does this. So with the proper bloodline and family being the case for Jesus' humanity, It wasn't Matthew's purpose to necessarily establish his humanity. His purpose was to establish that he's in the line of David. But you know, this has application to a lot of things, right? Remember 1 John chapter 4 and verse 2? Anyone that comes that says that Jesus did not come in the flesh is not of God. Go to the genealogy. He did come in the flesh. So even though it wasn't Matthew's purpose to establish that, there will arise because we were looking back in hindsight, there did arise different doctrines, false doctrines that would say Jesus did not come in the flesh. And when that happened, you could appeal to these kinds of texts to say, yes, he did. There was a man by the name of Marcion, another real winner, around 150 A.D., after uh, Jesus ascended uh, he was he wrote his canon he put books in the canon in other words he made his own Bible and he included only I think it was only 10 of Paul's letters and only the gospel of Luke and he left out something of the gospel of Luke the genealogy he did not believe that Jesus had come in the flesh to come in the flesh in their thinking was a corruption a corruption of deity And so you have to begin to adjust the scriptures to your thinking. So this application of this truth is far beyond what Matthew gave here. But we do need to understand the purpose of Matthew. And we need to be able to apply it appropriately uh, in our own lives as well. So genealogies were regarded as supporting the humanity of Jesus very early in the church In church history, they use them for that purpose. So there is great stress laid in both Matthew and Luke upon our Lord's right to sit upon the throne of David in the kingdom of of God. So let's look at some distinctives of Matthew's genealogy. Some distinctives, and there are a couple of them. One of the distinctives is that it is arranged systematically or excuse me, symmetrically. It is arranged symmetrically. There are three groups of 14 generations. Look at this, if you will, verse two. It goes all, verse two through the first part of verse six. Jesse was the father of David the king. And then it starts again. That's one set of 14 generations. David was the father of Solomon by Bathsheba. There's one, that's the second one, and it ends at verse 11. And the third one begins at verse 12 and it ends at verse 16. There are three groups of 14 generations, probably for memorization purposes. There's nothing mystical or anything about this. It's probably for memorization purposes. Little doubt Matthew was intentional in this. There are more than 14 generations But his purpose was to give enough information so that the fellow Jew could follow the line and there would be no doubt in his mind that this does establish his right to to be his uh, truth that he is in the line of David. So he was intentional in this. 
He has omitted several names to achieve this symmetry. But there's another feature about this, a distinctive about Matthew's genealogy, is that it includes four Old Testament women in this genealogy. Very unusual for a Jewish genealogy and And really, if we think about it, it's unnecessary for the purpose of establishing legality here. He did not have to add the ladies in here to establish legality, but he does. Five women, if you include Mary, she's in in what we know as the New Testament. But there are four Old Testament women. And the question is, why is Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba in this genealogy? One of the unique features. Well, one suggestion, and there are several, as you might have guessed, one suggestion was to view them as examples of sinners who found salvation in Israel's God. And that is true, but I'm not sure that that's a distinctive. That's true of every person. Everyone living at that era and time would look to Yahweh, the God of Israel, in faith and be saved. Not just women. It is everyone. So I'm not quite sure. That is a uniqueness that women are in there, but the reason why they're in there is not unique because everybody looked to Yahweh, the God of Israel, in faith and, and, and salva- for salvation. Another reason given is that the women are representative Gentiles who were saved, demonstrating uh, the broadness of the Abrahamic covenant. Remember, in you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So here is an example of the broadness of God's statement to Abraham. Even Gentiles are saved. And and there's no doubt that that's true. But why do you have to state it here? We already can read other Old Testament passages about these women. Why state it here? So we haven't answered our question fully yet. So my question here in my notes is, but is that a reason to include them in a king's genealogy? Just because they were Gentiles? Oh, you're a Gentile, you need to be included in a king's genealogy. Why? So here's what I think are some of the reasons why these women are included in the genealogy. The only factor that clearly applies to all four of these women is that suspicions of illegitimacy surrounded their lifestyle and their childbearing. Think about it. Tamar? Do you know anything about Tamar? Read. You need to read Genesis 39, I believe. You need to read that. Uh, Rahab? Oldest profession in the world. Ruth? She wasn't even... The, what... what what is Ruth doing? She's the product of an incestuous relationship between Lot and one of his daughters. She's a Moabite. What is she doing here? Bathsheba? Probably a Gentile. No, well, no doubt a Gentile. What is she doing here? So, I think one of the reasons they're here is that they all have suspicions or suspicion surrounds all of these Uh, regarding their lifestyle and their childbearing and or their childbearing this suspicion of illegitimacy fits perfectly with the circumstance of who mary who was thought to have had relations with the man before she was married remember that that's one thing they all have in common Key members of the messianic genealogy were haunted by similar suspicions and some of them were legitimate. But Matthew will strenuously deny that charge in verses 18 through 25. Next week, he's going to strenuously deny the charge of wrong behavior, of sinful behavior. And we'll see that next week. In fact, some Jews in the first century, remember for reference, John chapter 8 and verse 48, you're not the, you're the, you're the son of Beelzebub. You're the son, we, you're illegitimate. Remember that, John eight forty-eight. You're illegitimate. 
So some Jews in, his own, in Jesus' own day and in the centuries following explicitly charged that Jesus was an illegitimate child. So I I think that one of the reasons we have these women here is that they all have this one thing in common. And here's another reason, and it's really the convincing one, the kicker, so to speak. They all have a vital role in Judah's line of descent. A vital role in Judah's line of descent. Tamar and Ruth perform a vital role in providing for the line of descent for a clan or a family of major significance in Judah. Ruth and Boaz's son is Obed. Obed's son is Jesse. Jesse's son is David. And Rahab is just a few generations before that. They have come, these ladies, Tamar and Ruth especially, They have come for refuge under the wings of the God of Israel and have in their offspring, in their progeny, received a full reward from the Lord. They ran to him when they had no place to go. And God was gracious in that way. Rahab, in her own way, found refuge under the wings of the God of Israel. Joshua chapter 2. Remember that? She was already convinced. You remember when the spies showed up? We have heard how your God destroyed the Egyptians and delivered you with a mighty arm. She was it. She was a believer. And when, when the spies in Israel showed up, she wanted to be with them. Perhaps she is a great statement of God's grace being at a crucial time in Israel's history. Remember when Rahab lived? as they were entering the promised land. Could we say that the first person saved who actually lived in the promised land at the time was a Gentile harlot, a Gentile harlot who was saved, Rahab. Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, another man's wife, committed adultery, and yet her son was Solomon. So all of these considered, all of these things considered here, they have this similarity of illegitimacy that surrounds them and they all play a huge role in the line of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to see here in just a moment in making comments that this demonstrates God's grace. We'll see. No one is outside the reach of God's grace. No matter who you are or what you've done, God exalts whom he exalts. And no one can come to him with anything that's to offer him to convince him in the first place anyway. So we need to look at an outline. We know this outline. We've been through this. Three sections related to the three stages of Jewish history. It is related to the stages of Jewish history. Verses two through six, first part of verse six. That's Abraham to David. The origins of David's house. Here it is, the origins of David's house. The second part of verse 6 through verse 11, there's the David to the exile. This is the rise and decline of David's house. And then verses 12 through 16, exile to the Messiah, the eclipse of David's house. So here in this genealogy is represented the times of Abraham, the times of David, and the times of the Babylonian exile. They mark the beginnings of these three periods. Abraham begins the first section, David begins the second section, the Babylonian exile begins the last section. So what we have is an introduction to the genealogy in in verse 1. The record of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then the genealogy in verses 2 through 16. And then the summary statement at verse 17 concludes the whole section. Concludes the whole section. Now, there is something in verse 16 that we need to look at. It deserves a moment of our time here. Jacob, verse 16 says, Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, by whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. Who does 
grammar lesson. Who does by whom refer to? Mary, exactly. By whom is by Mary. So no one can say, your line, the line through Solomon, the line through Jehoiakim was wrong. You're cursed. No one, no king can come from that line. He's Joseph's son. No, he's not. By whom, by Mary, he was born. See the genius of God, the genius of Matthew in writing it this way. It settles the argument. Therefore, legally, Jesus is the son of Joseph, but also implicit in this statement here, you've seen it already, I'm sure, implicit in the statement is the virgin birth. He's not the son of Joseph. He's the son of Mary. What? How can he not be an uh, immaculate conception? That's the answer. And that will be the subject of the next section in verses 18 through 25. So the two phrases that we see, the son of David and the son of Abraham, means that his connection with the Hebrew race is both royal and racial. It is both royal and racial. He is everything that he needs to be. Everything that he needs to be. And the ultimate reach of his ministry is going to be universal. It's going to be beyond just this group, just these people. So this genealogy, genealogy excuse me, accomplishes God's good work as an argument for the Messiahship of Jesus. No one who was honest with the facts, could refute what was written here. Jesus is the Messiah in the line of David. They could deny belief. They could say, I refuse to believe what you're saying, but they could not overturn the truth. Remember, there, that was the case several times when Jesus was here alive on the earth. What do we do? There's no doubt he healed a man and nothing like this has ever been done before referring to John 9 and the man is born blind. So what do we do? We have to make up something. We have to do something to get this guy off the scene. We cannot deny that a miracle has been done. And anybody that's facing the facts and honest with the text cannot get around this. They just flat out have to look at it and in bold face arrogance say, no, I don't believe it. And that's what anybody does when they deny Christ, right? Because Romans 1, 18 through, 18 through 23, they already know there is a God. They already know, and they can see it. They know it in their conscience, Romans 2. Conscience bears witness, the law written on their heart. So it is a bold-faced rejection. And it would be in this case as well. But there is a significant broader truth that's communicated here. This genealogy does three things for us. And all of this information was good. We need to know this. You need to store it back here. You may need it sometime. This gives us greater confidence in our God. It's inspired scripture. There are no contradictions. This is just airtight. It's confusing because we don't know it. And so we need to study it and learn it and understand it. It gives us confidence and boldness. But there is broader truth and it's significant that's communicated here. This genealogy shows the providential work of God in people. Isn't this amazing that God would use a harlot, would save a harlot and then grant her such privilege to be in the genealogy of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? What did she do to deserve that? Nothing. Not a thing. It was just God's graciousness. So you and I sitting here today, why is it, how can it be that you and I could sit here and have such blessings and enjoy such privileges and have such a found, uh, foundation of a hope? What did they do to deserve that? Answer? Nothing. It was God's grace. Absolutely nothing. His providential work of God in people. God chooses to work in people. Fallen, broken, crippled, blind, 
sinful, he uses people. It's his pleasure to use people. Praise God. And if he has chosen to use us in some insignificant or significant way, in some little way, then we should praise God. And you see this line, this, this, represent, you re, this represents 2,000 years. From verse two through verse 16 represents 2,000 years. Because Abraham was born around 2166. 2,000 years right there. God chooses to use people. And he providentially moves them through. The second is that this genealogy proves that his power can and does overcome every and any obstacle. Everything, anything. God is going to accomplish his plan. He's going to accomplish his plan and you cannot stop it. So what we studied last week in Jeremiah 33, it will come to pass. But it's been so long, I know, but God will not forget his word. When will he come? I don't, I don't know. He hasn't told us when he'll come. In the twinkling of an eye, we'll be gone. But I know he will be faithful to his word. He proves that his power can and does overcome every and any obstacle. As bad as the world may look today, it has been worse. As bad as the world may be in the future, or in tomorrow or the next week, there's gonna come a time when it's really, really bad. And God will overcome that as well. So as we, you know, as we often say here, we get to this point and we say, so what am I to do? I go back to 1 Corinthians 4. It's required of stewards that they be found faithful. There it is. Just be faithful. Let's just be faithful. But we have the confidence that his power can and does overcome every and any obstacle in the way. He will accomplish his plan. Now, beloved, I desire to be right in the middle of all that. If it's his desire to save Cranberry Township, Pennsylvania, or if it's his desire to save Stockholm, Sweden, I want to be right there when he does it. I want to be the one that shares the gospel that sees them. Don't you? I, wanted, I, I don't want to be watching something somewhere. Though there are roles of prayer support and financial support and there are all those roles and somebody's got to fill them and I will work at trying to be content wherever the Lord has me but I want to be right in the center of it. I want to be there. I want to be the one standing on the street corner preaching when it happens. I, I, I want that. Well, it's going to cost you. I'm going to home anyway if it costs me the ultimate price. But I want to be there. I want to see God working. I want to be where he is working. I want to do what he has called me to do. And I want to, I want to see fruit. Of course we want to see fruit. Sometimes we don't. And so we're like trudging. And see. God help me to be faithful. Because I know you do overcome every obstacle. Just be faithful. The third thing, you can see it on the screen, demonstrates that his grace, this genealogy demonstrates that his grace reaches the lowest of sinners. I've talked with ladies who have done, I've talked with ladies who have committed murder before. And, and many of them are convinced that they cannot be saved because of what they've done. And I'm here to tell you it's not true. God's grace reaches anyone and everyone. And if you really, if we, if the rest of us, honestly, if the rest of us understood our sin for what it really is before our God, then we would be saying the same thing about us, about ourselves. How can we be saved? We're unsavable. We're so bad. But it's true. This genealogy, and with these four ladies in there, God demonstrates that his grace reaches the lowest of sinners and he can use anybody he desires. But here's a testimony of the faithfulness of God through 2,000 years. And I want to be a part of it. Whatever God is doing today, I want to be a part of it. Those truths 
Those three truths, and there are many more that we could write down. Those truths implicit in the genealogy of time, and the genealogy span time. They span civilizations. Represented in this 2,000 years here is Egypt, Canaanite, Jewish, Assyrian, Babylonian, Persian. It's cross-cultural. Different languages, it's the same truth. We don't have to change the truth. We just need to speak it in the same language. That we need to do. But we don't need to change the truth or alter it. And together, all of, they, all of this right here says God has a plan and man cannot alter that plan, yet God will be gracious to all who look to him in saving faith. That's what this genealogy says. God has a plan, man can't change it, yet God will be gracious to all who look to him in saving faith. That's what that genealogy says. And it's just as true today. All things are always in step with his good work. So this foundation, this foundation lasts from chapters 1 through 4. 4 verse 11. 1 through 4, 11. This is the foundation and you have this first little block in this foundation. And that is the legal line of Jesus. He is the Messiah. He is legitimate. This guy is for real. Later he would say, No man comes to the Father but by me. He would say a little bit later or earlier in John chapter 8, he said, unless you believe that I am, John 8, you will die in your sins. Do you know this man, Jesus Christ? Do you have a relationship with him? Are you confident of your position in Christ? Do you know that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Are you growing beyond that? Are you growing in your relationship with Jesus Christ? Thankfulness and gratefulness and and sharing your testimony and living truth, speaking kind to one another, all these kinds of things are part of your life. And Hebrews says, if these things are part of your life and growing and increasing, then you can be confident in your salvation. Confident? We're coming to this table this morning. And this table is here because it's the truth that God has given to us. And coming to this table this morning is is an act of worship. It's just like we've been doing all morning. Here is another kind of worship. The Lord's table or communion. We're commanded to observe this. And we do it with joy. And today there are Many of visitors here, and I've met several of you, and it's, it's such a joy to have you here. A real thrill. We trust that the worship thus far has been a blessing to you. But I want you to know that you are welcome to join us in communion. You must be a believer. You must have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And you need to examine your heart. Make sure there's no outstanding sins, no issues in your life that you need to resolve so that you can come before this table with a clear conscience. Not sinless, nobody's sinless, but not aware of matters in your life that need to be resolved. If that's you, then please join us in this worship. These elements here do not become the body or the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. These are symbolic of his death and resurrection, of his death symbolic of his death so in doing these we proclaim the death of Jesus Christ that one event that one act that paid for our sins that satisfied the father's righteousness we proclaim that because that is the gospel Christ came he died and he rose on the third day so I invite you to worship with us men if you would come forward